Hello, welcome to the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. This is your host, Roy Kessel, and today we're very excited to have with us Jason Schraub. Jason is the National Vice President of Partnerships and Chief of Staff to the President of Operation Hope. Jason, welcome to the show. Roy, thank you for having me. Uh, we're excited to have you with us. I know this is a very challenging time for so many organizations around the country, so many individuals uh, locked up at home. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of those types of issues today for people that want more specific details on the normal uh, operations and normal functions of, a, uh, of Operation Hope. We have a great podcast that we did last year, and I'll link that in the page once we get everything posted here. But I think today we wanted to focus on some of the special efforts that you're undertaking in, in light of this crisis. So maybe you can give everybody a little bit of background of, of what you're doing, uh, what your role is at Operation Hope, and then what you're creating now. Sure. Um, well, so again, I, I am our, our Vice President for Partnerships here uh, around the country at Operation Hope, and we are an organization that's been around for 27, 28 years now, uh, founded in the aftermath of the uh, what are known as the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles in 1992 in, in, in South Central Los Angeles. And the idea at the time was that the, the, the reason why people were, were so angry and so upset um, certainly was, was partially because of the verdict but more so because there are entire swaths of our community that, that feel left out of the system. Uh, they feel left out of, of, of the banking system, the free enterprise system, the financial system, the justice system, the, the American dream. And so if we can go into these communities and, and uh, teach people the language of money, the language of entrepreneurship, and, and also give them the tools to be able to succeed in the system as we have it, uh, it'll do a lot more than just solve issues of poverty, but it will also create new downtowns and, and will uh, uplift neighborhoods and, and, and will change health outcomes and, and so on. And now 19 years ago, uh, we opened another division and that division was called uh, Hope Coalition America. Um, it's now called um, Hope, Hope Inside Disaster. Um, and this was founded in the aftermath of September 11th. Uh, because what we what we saw was after a enormous uh, disaster an enormous tragedy like that there were a huge number of people who went from um, being perhaps uh, financially or economically stable to now being sole breadwinners and what we saw was that folks after having a personal disaster were now for months and years afterwards now facing additionally an economic disaster and a financial disaster. Um, and so we became the partner of, uh, of FEMA and of the American Red Cross uh, in response to September 11th as the, again, the economic recovery partner. So where FEMA and the Red Cross will come in for weeks after a disaster and help fill, fix things like infrastructure, uh, make sure people are, are fed, and clothed, and so on then what? So we come in and stay typically for uh, as long as two or three years uh, and help folks to recover from a disaster, whether it be natural, uh, man-made, uh, or as we're talking about right now, pandemic. Um, and so uh, we provide folks with the coaching, the tools, the assistance, the referrals um, in order to, again, avoid having a personal natural man-made disaster become again a, a economic disaster for you and your family as well yeah i think the challenge as you're talking about these disasters is right now and, and typically as with any disaster there's an enormous spotlight on the uh, impacted area right now it's obviously global but typically most of the things that we've experienced in the past are, are limited in scope geographically based on, on weather, whether it's flooding or hurricanes or tornadoes or uh, something like 9-11 where the direct impact is, is fairly localized. Uh, the challenge I think is different that we're facing now with, with the national scope, but I, the other area that, that I see 
as a struggle is there's a lot of attention while it's going on. And you and I have spoken before about the impact of, of being locked up and quarantined and everybody sitting at home. And then once people can get out and life sort of starts coming back to normal, everybody just, a lot of the issues get much less attention. There's a lot less focus on what are the long-term problems that are really left behind. Because if we're all locked up for 60, 90, 120 days, whatever number it's going to be, uh, the world is not going to just snap back and, and be back in place in terms of people's economic situation. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and a group that really is affected by that, Roy, to your point, is, is small businesses and small business owners. Because a lot of what's being uh, proposed and is likely to happen for small businesses is that they're going to receive uh, loans at, 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 at very low interest rates, but they're going to receive loans in order to uh, continue their business. But if they don't have a strong business plan, if they don't have uh, strong business viability and, and continuity plans and so on, um, then all we're really doing is, 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 is delaying. We're not actually uh, putting folks on the path to uh, sustainability and success. And that's another area um, where we are working very closely in making sure that folks have the tools, the coaching, and the expert assistance to go alongside some of the, uh, the financial resources that are becoming made available right now. I think the struggle there is going to be how they allocate those resources and, and how they determine uh, the amount that you're eligible for in a loan program. Um, there's a lot of businesses, just given the cyclical nature or the timing of, of how their business works, where certain times of the year uh, may be better. Uh, I know a lot of the uh, food and beverage industry and, and restaurants and bars got hit really hard with the March Madness getting canceled and all of the sports seasons being canceled, which probably mm -hmm. involves the playoffs for the NHL and the NBA and, and other things like that as well. And, and let's and, not forget, Roy, not just the, the, the businesses, but also the folks who work in the stadiums uh, who are uh, for, for the NBA and the MLS and the NHL. Um, I mean, this is, these are livelihoods that have just disappeared. Well, there, there was a story yesterday where a restaurant owner in, I think it was in Ohio, had to lay off 450,000 people from the re restaurant group or some, some crazy number. Maybe, maybe it was 4,500 people. I'm, I'm missing the number somewhere. That's too many. But, I mean, it was, a, it was still a crazy number of individuals from his whole group because you can't be open and there's only so many people you can pay to do takeout and, and everything else that, that's going on. Mm -hmm. And it, it also the impact is dramatic on, on startup businesses because, again, I don't know how they're going to determine eligibility for loans, but many times uh, you've seen it structured based on two or three year historical earnings or revenues or, or something like that. And so somebody who's really poured their heart and soul into a business for six to 18 months to get something off the ground and is really just starting to get that revenue, they may not even be eligible for some of these packages. Yeah, and, and so we are, we are involved in, in advising uh, the Secretary, the Treasury, and the, and the Comptroller of the Currency on, on what businesses really need. Uh, um, but in the end, the, what, the package that gets um, approved as a, as a relief package, both locally and federal, uh, is going to be um, whatever it is. And, and, and when that happens, People need to know what is the best way to engage with it in order to uh, ensure the viability of my business, as well as personally, uh, of, of, of my situation. Um, so, for instance, it seems very likely right now that Americans, uh, adults, will be receiving uh, one or two checks of $1,000 uh, each. And so, if that happens, you actually have a lot of choices on what to do there. Do I... Uh, do I pay off a credit card? Do I pay my rent? Do I um, 
put it towards savings. You know, we, we have a lot of decisions that need to be made. Um, and so you really need to understand both what are the, the, the frameworks that, are, that we're operating within right now, but also what's changed. So for instance, you may be able to put your mortgage in, in, in forbearance and you may be able to actually uh, not pay that for a couple months and not get in any, uh, not have any consequence for doing so. That, that may be a possibility, but you certainly want somebody to be in your corner, making sure that you fully understand the, 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 the choices that you have available to you, uh, as well as what are, the, what, are the, uh, what are the consequences and what are the advantages to you making those choices. I think there's going to be a lot of competing demands on people once the amount of money is, is determined. So some people are going to look at that and um, consider it, I guess, a short-term windfall that, mm -hmm. that they're able to, to, to put a few dollars in their pocket. They've got some money for their kids and, and you know, they, they can pay their basic bills. But the reality is that that money is uh, going to have to last considerable amount of time with some of these estimates talking about the, the economic impact of this going on for six to 12 months or longer. Um, certainly the government is not going to be in a position to fund that type of support for such an extended period. And there's going to be a lot of jobs that frankly don't bounce back very quickly, even when the quarantine is over. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would anticipate even when the immediate quarantine is done, that if, if sports, for example, restart, that they're probably still going to be played without fans for a certain amount of time. I think even when bars and restaurants reopen, they're going to have reduced capacity or reduced operating hours or, or something of that nature, just uh, as a precaution so that we don't end up creating inadvertently a second wave or a, a second spike. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that, that a lot of the mandated business closures and social distancing that are, that are meant to slow this are already severely impacting employment. Um, they're having a, a catastrophic event uh, effect on, on, on small business, on employees, and so we are here to help the best that we can. Um, but there, 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 there's no question that a huge number of our neighbors and our colleagues and our friends and, 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 and our, our countrymen are, are, are going to be hurting. Um, and so it's our, it's our goal to make sure that folks have um, the resources to make the best decisions that they can within the framework. Uh, Roy, I mean, we, we, we certainly don't expect that a whole lot of people will emerge in a financially stronger position um, than they were when they started, but, but we want to make sure that... Unless they stocked uh, up on a lot of toilet paper, then they, they might have a way to do that. <laughs> well, you know, there's some states like Michigan that have actually uh, passed laws around, around price gouging. You, you can't resell anything for more than 20% more than what you paid for it. Um, but, 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 but I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> the, the other area that, that hits me is there's been a lot of talk about, for lack of a better term, sort of uh, subsidies or bailouts for certain industries, whether it's airlines, cruise lines, hotels, all of these types of, of businesses. And, and what's been really interesting to me as as we go through and, and, and look at all of that stuff is, I don't know if anger is the right word, but to a certain extent, I think that's accurate, where so many people in, in small businesses of all types, whether it's small restaurants, small retail, and even in our world with the, the sports philanthropy world, I've spoken to a number of organizations this week that are expressing their concern about what happens to our funding, right? We need to be lobbying the legislature for funding for our programs, for education, for fighting obesity, for keeping kids active, keeping them engaged. And, and mm -hmm. sports uh, on, in the immediate term looks like a background issue because individuals are saying, well, that's not as much of a life or death situation. But in, in the long run, having kids sitting 
for extended periods of time away from their support networks impacts mental health, keeping them inside and not having them uh, with the same degree of physical activity and, and the fight against obesity and everything else uh, has a, a great long-term impact on, on the healthcare system. So from, from your perspective, how do you look at what nonprofits can do and, and how you would see this playing out in terms of where they can go and get that support because an enormous percentage comes from individual donors and and most of those donors right now are are scared they're they're not going to be in a position to say hey my my ten dollar gift or hundred dollar gift or thousand dollar gift is something i'm comfortable giving right now because i don't know if i have a job i don't know if i can keep going uh and that's true with every business well, you know, one of the things that, that we're going to be working with folks on is that question of how do, how do we adapt our model based on what the current realities are? Um, and so yeah, I'll, I'll get to the nonprofits in a second, but one of the things that we're, we're coaching small businesses on is if the model that you have typically had is not, vi- is not viable in this environment, perhaps there are other things that you can do. Um, that will still be successful right now. So, you know, we've got a distillery in Chicago, Koval, that has uh, actually turned a lot of their um, alcohol making into making hand sanitizer. Um, it turns out the expertise that they have is not that far off from something that's, that's desperately in need right now. Um, and you, there are plenty of catering companies, restaurants uh, that are able to shift from instead being sort of a, a, a retail operation to providing meals for, uh, for kids who, 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 who typically would be getting those meals at school um, or, or to hospitals or other places where uh, the food need, need is there. So there are a number of businesses and a number of nonprofits that have a expertise that actually can be shifted to be perhaps even more valuable right now um, than they've ever been before. And so, uh, first of all, we're here to provide uh, technical expertise and guidance on what are some of the, you know, the business models that, 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 that might work for you right now. Um, but also, it, it is important to know that there are a number of, of, of grants that are becoming available, um, both from the foundation side and from the government side, that have not been there before, um, that, are, that are specifically meant to uh, to solve for that challenge um, because there are a number of services that are out there um, that are perhaps considered to be on the periphery of, of, of the essential, but are absolutely critical to things like, as you said, physical well-being, mental well-being, um, and, and, and the support services that the that, that children and the families need. Uh, and sports are a big part of that. Uh, in fact, I know for me personally, when professional sports return, that's going to be a big sign for me uh, of, of a step towards normalcy. I mean, to me, that, that means that everything's going to be okay. Uh, even though it, it, it may to some feel like uh, a, a little bit trivial, uh, that, that, that tells me that we're, we've made a big step in the right direction. Things are going to be all right. And if you look around, I think sports are a symbol in, in our world, in our society, and, and really across the world of, of unity, of empowerment, uh, when you, and coming together, rallying cry type of situation. When you look at some of the biggest disasters over the last 20 years, and you look at what happened at, for example, NFL and college football stadiums the week after 9-11 when people were able to get together for the first time you look at what happened in new orleans with the first game after hurricane katrina and the emotion and everything that was like that release and that satisfaction that the that the whole community could could rally around uh, i think we're going to see something similar to that but uh, I, right now i don't think anybody has truly a good sense of an estimate of when, when is that going to be what what kind of time frame are we looking at before this type of thing comes back together right now we everybody knows for the most part april and may are canceled and uh 
I think people are expecting to pretty much hunker down for for 60 days. But what what does it mean? What does it look like after that? Um, as we talk to groups that have events going on in June, nobody knows what to expect. Should they go ahead with the plans for those? Should they cancel them now? Should they wait and see? Well, what are you seeing out there from your end? Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of things are getting canceled. Um, we have shifted. Uh, so we, had a, we have a, a, a huge event that we throw at the end of May every year called the Hope Global Forum. Um, it is, it's been called the Davos for the poor. Um, but we, we bring together three or 4,000 uh, world leaders to work on issues of economic equality and inclusion. And um, we had to completely change it. So uh, just this past week, the new economic realities um, that we're facing in, in, in a time of this pandemic, um, but doing so in a way where, where we're not physically be bringing people together. Um, because we figured that even if, um, even if we are no longer in um, some form of quarantine at that point, are we gonna wanna put 3,000 people in a room together? Probably, probably not. Um, so we will Jason, be having just to back up for a second. You cut out for just a second there when you were talking about uh, the Hope Global Forum. Obviously, is scheduled at the end of May typically, and then you were talking about how you recast that event for this year. So let's go through that again. Sure. So it's going to be this year instead. It's going to be an, an e forum um, where we're going to bring together uh, world leaders virtually to talk about what the new economic reality is and what are the things and steps that we can take um, in order to make this new reality and this new economic uh, system that exists work for all. Uh, we'll then be having our physical forum, our annual meeting uh, in, in the fall. It's either gonna be in October or December at this point. Um, and so what, what we have tried to do is make sure that, that we are still providing um, the, the, the services and the education that people need from this kind of event. Um, but realistically, having thousands of people in a room together in, in, in the next couple months really is not a, uh, a, a, a viable or, 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 or safe thing to be doing. And so, so again, this week we, 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 we shifted and changed, but without hopefully getting rid of um, a lot of the value that the, uh, that the event has. I think that's a challenge you're going to see with lots of organizations because having experienced the, the forum last year, I, I know the amount of energy that's in the room, the number of people that are there, the high level of communication and, and everything going on. And I think it's really hard to replicate that in a, a virtual event. Uh, people are willing to come and, and, be at a live event for two or three days and have opportunities for all manner of communications and interactions. I don't know how many people could sit like we are right now in a virtual environment and sit here for from 8 a.m. to 5 or 6 p.m. for a couple of days in a row. You're going to walk away with a very different type of feel and different ability to interact. Well, Roy, I've, I've been joking around that we're going to have one and a half forums this year, uh, which is to say that uh, the one in May, is, it's kind of like a half forum. Uh, it, it, it's, it's more likely only going to be one day. Um, and while people are able to get the education that they need and, the, uh, and, and certainly some of the inspiration that they're looking for, um, there, there absolutely will be things that just don't get um, – translated and, and and that's why we are still going to have that in-person forum towards the end of the year because uh you're right no, nothing can replicate really just the, the 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 power and the and the and the inspiration and 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 the, and the connections that come from um those types of in in, in in-person meetings um and so actually our sponsors are are quite happy right now because to my joke they're now getting to sponsor one and a half events for the price of one. <laughs> but uh, so they're, 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 they're actually pleased by this, but, um, 
Uh, but the, the, it's, it's another example of, of where um, we have to we, we have to adapt in these times. We, we, we can't operate as uh, as business as usual, just like uh, just like uh, other businesses and other nonprofits can't do that either. So as you look at the challenges you face as an organization now over the next, call it 90 to 120 days, because I don't know if any of us can really predict much beyond that. How, how do you see things evolving in terms of the, the communications that you need to have and the level of partnerships that you're creating for Operation Hope? It's a lot more challenging to build those relationships virtually. You can still do some of that by phone, but you can't be out in front of people. You can't be out in, in the community and, and building groups in the same way. So how do you see that working for Operation Hope? Well, Roy, I'm really glad you asked that question uh, because we have been asked to scale our operations tremendously. Um, last year, we served about 150,000 adults with all of our services. We have 150 physical locations, 152 uh, physical locations in 23 states around, around the United States. And, and, and most of our work uh, in the past has been happening in person. Um, whenever there has been a disaster, um, we typically will deploy a couple staff, and then we'll also have a, 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 a national call line that's available for people uh, to use. And so here are the numbers. Again, we, we've served, we served about 150,000 people, uh, adults last year total. And in the last 19 years, our disaster relief programs have helped 1.3 million people to uh, recover and return to normalcy economically and financially in the aftermath of, of, of a disaster. Now that sounds like a lot. That's not, we're going to need to enormously increase our capacity and pretty much instantly to be able to, to, to uh, serve the magnitude of, of this crisis, right? Um, and you brought it up actually at, at, at the very beginning that a lot of what we have done and, and, and others has been geographically limited in the past. And, and now we need to be everywhere. And so we have, first of all, already stood up uh, a, a national call center, uh, which I'll be happy to give the phone number for, as well as a, a, a website uh, giving folks the basic information of, first of all, what services are available. Um, so we are able to provide for folks things like, um, first of all, credit ed education and coaching, um, financial disaster budget planning for individuals and families, money management education and coaching, um, assistance with uh, creditor and mortgage debt deferment, uh, and then guidance and referrals around things like food, clothing, shelter, FEMA assistance. Um, and so the number that you can call for that is 1-888-388-HOPE, um, which is 4673. So again, that's 1-888-388-HOPE. Um, or you can go to our website, uh, which we have already stood up as well, which is hopeinsidecovid19.org. So again, H-O-P-E-I-N-S-I-D-E-C-O-V-I-D-1-9.org. And so these are things- Let me just written. repeat those for everybody, just in case you didn't have a chance to get all of those numbers. The, the phone number for the National Call Center is 888-388-HOPE. That's 388-4673. And then the website is hopeinsidecovid19.org. So I know that there's great resources that are up there now, and I'm sure that's a resource that will continue to be built as we find out more information and as the scale of what's going on and, and plans for economic assistance become more uh, definite. So Roy, we have 150 coaches who are trained and ready uh, to provide assistance all throughout the country. Uh, and again, you can you can uh, request that assistance either by by calling the uh, the phone number uh, or or through an online form through the website right there. Um, but we are going to need to grow exponentially to be able to uh, to to service the the folks who are going to need it. And so. 
Um, we very much need help with both funding and with volunteers uh, to be able to, to grow this program. Um, we're going to have an enormous amount of, of, of triage that needs to happen where somebody calls in and they're not even sure what help they need at this point. Yeah. And so we absolutely have uh, a, a, a huge need for um, volunteers to be available uh, on the phone lines. And we are able to route our, our, our phones to our volunteers. So you could say, hey, I'm available from 1 to 4 p.m. on Saturdays. Uh, and we can train you such that you can be able to, to help folks as, as they're calling in, trying to figure out where, where they need to go. Um, and so we'll have a couple different tiers of volunteers. Some will be trained as experts, uh, and some will be trained as, uh, I guess I'll call them routers for the moment, and making sure that people are, 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 are sent to the right resources and, and, and in the right direction. Um, but more than what anything, does that training, what does that training look like? If, if we have people that are listening, people in our network that want to participate and want to help in this space, and they say, hey, Jason, I've got either I have some background in, in these issues in terms of finance, credit, money management, anything like that, or, hey, I just have time, but I really don't have any background. What, what would that process look like for a volunteer? Absolutely. So you can sign up to become a volunteer on our website, again, at hopeinsidecovid19.org. Um, we have a robust volunteer management and, and, and training program um, that's actually been uh, donated to us by our partners at the American Red Cross. Um, so when we think about a, a, a robust uh, volunteer management and volunteer training platform, uh, probably nobody does it better than, than, than the Red Cross does. Um, and so we're working very closely with them on, 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 on their platform and their program. Um, but it's also led by uh, uh, one of our, our, our veterans of hope who's been here for a long time, Evelyn du Um And we have already trained and managed uh, over 10,000 members of what we call the Hope Corps, which is our volunteers. So we do have a, we have a history and a track record of, uh, of training volunteers and, and, and making sure that they have uh, a valuable experience as well and where they're comfortable providing help and support. So if we, if we put the call out to our network and, and people want to participate just to give them a sense of magnitude, because sometimes I get the feeling that there's a call for volunteers. And if somebody doesn't hear about it right away, they say, Oh, I'm sure they got enough people already. There's no sense in me calling now because I didn't hear about it for, for two or three days later. Give us a sense of the magnitude of the number of people that you're looking for. I couldn't even tell you, Roy. Um, in the but thousands, it's a big number. It's a lot. In the thousands would be okay. ideal. Um, again, we, we've served 1.3 million disaster survivors in the last 19 years. So that's uh, a little under 100,000 a year. Um, we're expecting that we're going to need to serve well over 100,000 people per month. Um, and so to be able to grow that kind of scale uh, instantly, so this isn't something that we've had years uh, uh, to prepare for, we, we, we've had to actually create that infrastructure in a matter of days and stand it up in a matter of days. Um, it's going to require a lot of people and it's going to require a lot of resources, right? We're, we're, we're going to need to raise about $5 million in the next uh, in the next two weeks in order to be able to um, manage the volunteers and to hire uh, enough full-time professional coaches uh, to be able to, to uh, uh, serve the entire, entire nation as well. Um, and so we are going to be uh, in need really of resources first, volunteers second, and then uh, tracking and, 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 and reporting third. Those are going to be the, the, uh, the, the, the three steps that happen here. So from a timeline perspective, I, I would expect for folks who sign up to become volunteers, we're probably about two weeks from um, having a, uh, a full program available uh, for them to uh, be able to provide help and support. Uh, and for them to be able to receive the training they need and, and have the full um, uh, process stood up and in place. 
Well, obviously, it's enormous undertaking in terms of everything that you're looking at. You guys have an incredible track record of uh, national work and national scope. And as you said, uh, using your numbers at 150,000 adults that you served last year, and now you're looking at getting to the point where you need to serve 100,000 per month. So for, for people that are looking at those numbers, you can really appreciate the magnitude of what is going on here and uh, the challenge that Jason has to pull all of those resources together. And I think what's important for our listeners to understand is there's a lot of ways that you can help. And so uh, we have people that have access to, to capital or funding for partnerships and, and from grants. We have people that have strong coaching backgrounds in, in all areas that might be useful either as volunteers or as high-level staff that, that can be brought in without a need for a lot of additional training, um, as well as uh, the support, as you said, volunteers that are going to help triage situations, refer them out to the right resources, and then finally your last piece in terms of the tracking and reporting. Um, there's certainly people uh, in positions that have that type of experience that now may be sitting at home because their businesses are, are closed or because uh, maybe they still have the same functions that they need to perform for their company, but they're saving two hours or more a day on commuting. And, mm -hmm. and they could take uh, a couple of those hours a week and, and, and lend that over to Operation Hope. Absolutely. Jason, we will. I want to have you give the phone number and the website one more time before we wrap up so everybody has a chance to hear that again. Uh, thank you, Roy. We, we absolutely will be hiring. Um, and so um, please do keep an eye out on that front. Uh, the phone number that folks can call uh, if you need help is going to be one 888 Hope, which is one 388 4673 And then the website for if you either need help or want to chip in and help. Uh, so if you want to donate, if you want to volunteer, if you want to partner, that's going to be www.hopeinsidecovid19.org. There are no spaces, no underscores. Uh, no, no hyphens. It is hope inside COVID19.org. And obviously we'll be sending this information out on, on our social platforms as well. And if you're seeing this and listening to this, you can look at, at our website and the podcast page for Jason and look at all of the information will be listed there as well. And we hope that you'll feel free to share all of those details with, with your own personal networks and your own personal contacts because uh, as I look around, there's so many people, um, let's say, complaining that they've got nothing to do. Uh, and, and we have more than enough organizations that have great uses of your time in great ways that you could help people that are really being heavily impacted by this disaster. So Jason, thank you very much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your, your time today and, and everything that you've given us. And uh, we look forward to finding more ways that we can help Operation Hope. Thank you, Roy. It was a pleasure to be with you. And you and your family, stay well, stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you. This is Roy Kessel signing off for the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. We hope you'll join us for our next episode.